welcome to Freedom Fighters Code Gray. This is a show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that's taking place locally and globally. How does the financial sector intersect with human trafficking? And what is the financial sector doing to address this type of criminality? Well, today with me, I have the director of the Financial Intelligence Unit at Scotiabank, Joseph Murray, who's going to share his expertise on the subject. Welcome, Joseph, and thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Raquel. Looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, so just to start off with, some of our viewers tuning in today, they maybe never have heard of trafficking before. So could you just take some time to explain what exactly is human trafficking and what are the different types of trafficking that exist? Sure. So I'll, I'll try my best there. That was one of the uh, the learning curves for us in the financial uh, services industry was to become acquainted with terminology, sensitivity training, understanding uh, well beyond what is required to work within a bank or the financial intelligence unit. Uh, but we've done a great job with our partners and with people like yourself uh, that are the you know, the experts in the field to help bring that awareness up, bring that knowledge up. Uh, but trafficking, you know, initially, uh, I'll refer to it within the through the lens of the financial uh, service industry. So trafficking is something we referred to uh, kind of monolithically in the early days of our approach to trying to mitigate risks associated to it and contribute to essentially its downfall and, and its elimination. Uh, however, trafficking is something where, where you, you know, can profit off uh, an individual through coercion or suppression or manipulation, both if they are knowing or unknowing of that act taking place. And there's many different types of trafficking that can occur, labor trafficking, commercial sexual slavery, uh, you know, even to a certain degree, child exploitation, uh, all of them are types of trafficking that can occur. So the best definition, and I can't recite it off, off top of my head, uh, is under the Palermo Protocol of 2000. So that is something that many legal frameworks are in different jurisdictions, including Canada, take from uh, that definition. Uh, so you can look at our Government of Canada website and, and trafficking will be defined there, uh, but in the criminal code, and it would also be uh, with the Palermo Protocol, the UN Palermo Protocol, uh, that's about 20 years old now. Uh, so all of this is stuff that we learned after, because what we really did focus on up front, and we'll get into this, is how can we identify the nexus or touch points with financial industry uh, with traffickers of different types of trafficking. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful. It was very helpful. Thank you. And I'm curious to know, when did you first learn about human trafficking and how did you come to be involved in this type of work? Well, I, I really do like telling the story because it really shows that uh, there is a people or you know, people behind or a person uh, behind financial institutions. So when you look at financial institutions, they're old, they're very prominent in terms of their branding and the buildings that they have. Uh, and sometimes they can be cast in a negative light. That's, that's you know, profit tends to trump people. Uh, and that is where the story uh, begins. And it actually debunks that perception in that a person or a handful of people manage to create momentum around the awareness of trafficking and bring that message inside some of the major financial institutions in Canada to uh, essentially sort of bringing awareness and creating indicators that can be used to identify trafficking in a financial um, world. So that all started with a conference that was held in 2015 by an association called the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists. And they're a survivor, a Canadian survivor of trafficking, Tamea Nagy, who many in, the, in this world will know that name. Uh, she put out a call to financial institutions to help with the identification of funds and profit from trafficking for commercial sexual exploitation. That call was to a room full of ACAMS certified individuals and an individual by the name of Peter Wark, who was a director at Bank of Montreal at the time, uh, took that message. He, I think he publicly, I wasn't there, but from the stories that I've heard, which have kind of become uh, the legend, the stuff of, of uh, tall tales and, and uh, AML mythology now. Uh, but apparently he stood up and he answered the call, so moved by her story about what she had shared. He brought that back, and I was working uh, for Peter. I was reporting into him at the time at Bank Montreal, and he said that we are going to combat human trafficking. Uh, we were a little bit nervous because it seemed that he made a pretty public commitment to doing this. Uh, but now a number of years later, uh, I can say that the what Canada has done, not only our team uh, at Bank of Montreal when I was there, 
but what Canada has done uh, on multiple fronts with trafficking has been recognized around the globe. So that organic call to action and the people within financial institutions and then eventually the boards and their uh, and the senior leadership within those financial institutions uh, all aligned and all made a significant difference, I would say, in the fight against trafficking uh, on the financial side. Wow, that is such an incredible story. And I'm grateful that you took the time to share it. And what stood out to me is Tamea, who is a survivor, used her voice and um, her experience and expertise to really encourage and motivate the finance financial industry to begin tackling this issue from this unique lens. And so for people who are listening and they're probably wondering, whoa, I never even realized that the financial industry could do something to fight human trafficking. What, in what ways would you explain to people about how these two industries intersect? How does the financial sector and the human trafficking relate to one another? Mm -hmm. So I, I've ended up, so in, when I, we opened the conversation, I said I wasn't uh, you know, a real expert uh, on the, 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 you know, the, the frontline service providers are really the ones that understand this crime, I'd say, very well because they're seeing the people that are affected by it. And then even law enforcement, that they're the ones going out and actually having to uh, you know, bring people to justice as well. So I spent a lot of time on the academic side learning about the nuances of trafficking and and learning about the different interpretations and you know how certain words can be a trigger and a certain words can be uh, supportive and kind of towards a rebuilding. Um, so all of those are, are you know is, is something that I, I think that the industry has taken a keen um, interest in uh, over the last you know six years since they've been introduced. But some of the academic pieces, some of the research pieces that I've looked at are, you know, the Polaris, uh, one of the Polaris reports, I believe from 2017, which talks about um, intersections between legitimate industries and common types of business models traffickers use. So they outlined about 25 different illegitimate business models across eight different industries in America, legitimate industries, and in there was hospitality, travel, banking, healthcare, and of the eight, um, financial institutions had the, the most touch points across all of those different business models. Wow. That is a study for me, and Polaris is a, you know, for those that don't know, they offer um, um, survivor support with a hotline that they offer nationally. They compile information, statistics. I think they're one of the largest holders of trafficking-related statistics, definitely in America, if not the world. And they have some really great people that work there, uh, Sarah Crow being one of them, who I think maybe you recently may have touched base with, Michaela. So they're, they're fantastic. They actually have a financial institution type arm where that assists in research on that front. So that is one piece of research I point to to highlight in an audience that may be skeptical about why a bank is getting behind this. It's not just a sustainability initiative. It's not a social good initiative. Those are aspects, those are things that we do take into consideration, but there actually is a tangible touch point, a regulated touch point that we have to uphold. It just, you know, there may have not been 100% transparency and understanding what that was to your question, because we get that question quite a bit, um, but it is there and that, that particular study highlights that. And the other, I think, more simplistic thing that you can point to is majority of crime, you know, in a general sense, is, is committed for profit, is committed for financial gain. Trafficking, if you get into the academia of it, there are certain things that are not committed for financial gain. But I would say that especially for trafficking, for the purpose of commercial sexual exploitation, you have the commercial right in there that insinuates profit. And the majority of that crime that's committed is for money. So if they're doing it for money, there's money to follow. And then you have that age old saying of follow the money. Uh, and that's what we've been doing. You mentioned that there's been amazing work done here in Canada and that now kind of the rest of the world is paying attention to that and following suit. Could you shed light on some of the initiatives that Canada has been a leader in as yes. it results, as it relates to, you know, combating trafficking through the financial sector? Mm -hmm. So Canada is, I would say, best known in this department for something called Project Protect. So Project Protect is what originated out of that 
conference challenge that was posed by Timea. And Project Protect is an industry-led, financial services industry-led initiative to raise awareness and increase reporting of suspicious activity related to money laundering, where the predicate offense, this is the fence that generates the dirty money, is trafficking for the pur purpose of commercial sexual exploitation. That is the project that we launched in 2016 and has been running ever since. And the benefits of that project are that we've raised a significant amount of attention, so much so that our federal government partners through the five-year action plan that's been updated, acknowledge the existence of Project Protect, and then also um, the work that we've done on, on reporting numbers. So if you look at FinTrack, our national FIU run by the government, uh, they take all the suspicious activity in across all different crimes from all different financial institutions that have a reporting obligation. And you do see the percentage of suspicious transaction reports ticking up over those years with regards to human trafficking for sexual uh, for commercial sexual exploitation so that is taken note or, you know internationally the un the osce uh you know, groups um, across the world have asked how did you do it in canada without being told to do it by your government partners um, or government regulators and that is i think something that we're very proud of is that industry came together to create something as opposed to being told to do something through a regular a piece of legislation of regulation that's amazing and just incredible work. So kudos to you and everyone else who is a part of that initiative. Really briefly, could you maybe give a tangible example of what that looks like? So what does Project Protect, when implemented, result in? Yeah, so that, that is something that, you know, there, we can have a whole conversation on those indicators. FinTrack has published those indicators. You can look at them online. If you Google FinTrack Project Protect, there's about 50, I think, or, or so red flags but when you hear them in piecemeal they're not that they're, they're pretty uh, innocuous or ambiguous you know late night pharmaceutical purchases fast food purchases hotels within a certain proximity of where someone is stated to live all those things we all do but when you start to layer them together you paint a very interesting picture of a Canadian or someone who has a Canadian bank account. And if you layer those on top of each other, late night cash withdrawals, large cash deposits, fast food purchases, hotel food purchases, all of those things come together. And usually we have to use several because FinTrack acknowledges that anyone does not insinuate potential trafficking. But when you put them together, you're left with such a small segment of people who transact in that way. And you can start to really identify some suspicious behavior. We're not putting people in jail. So to, we're, we're just reporting on suspicion, but that suspicion, you can tell it's there because out of millions of customers, you'll be left with potentially 20. Uh, and that is in itself very unusual. Wow. Well, thank you so much for the impactful work that you and your team are doing, Joe. This has been a really enlightening conversation, and I'm excited to continue this discussion after we take a short break. to Freedom Fighters Code Grey, a show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that's taking place locally and globally. In today's episode, I have with me the director of the Financial Intelligence Unit at Scotia Bank, Joe, who's going to share his expertise and continue this discussion on how the financial sector intersects with trafficking. So Joe, we were just talking about, you know, this concept of FinTrack which is this program that helps identify trends as it relates to banking and identify suspicious activity. Could you break that down for our viewers? What sure. does that actually entail? How would someone go about being flagged as, you know, this is potentially a suspicious activity? And what's the follow-up as it relates to, okay, now we've reported some suspicious activity. What happens next? Well, you know, there's a, this is like a history lesson here that I would encourage from myself. I'm a little biased, obviously, to get into this online. Uh, but there's certain pieces of legislation, certain agreements internationally that have happened over the last 40 years uh, to start to set up a, like a global standard for anti-money laundering and financial crime risk mitigation. But if I had to point to two events to make it interesting for those listening that have actually really done a lot to bring up the profile of the importance of the work that we do 
within financial institutions. And what FinTrack does is uh, 2001, September 11th with terrorist financing, because in, in our world, terrorist financing and AML are usually spoken of in the same breath, although very different, but they're two things that are financial, have financial touch points that we look out for. So September 11th did a lot because when they started to unpack what happened, they realized that it was financed through unusual means that went through um, uh, banks around the world. So that is one event. And the other event is later in that decade, I think it was 2007, 2008, the Bernie Madoff, the stock market collapse or the many market collapses off of the Ponzi scheme that Bernie Madoff was running, uh, the former chairman of the NASDAQ stock exchange. That was another big tipping point to show the damage that can occur when financial crimes are perpetrated. Uh, so from there, I would say it's been exponential growth on the investment of Scotiabank that I work for, other banks in Canada, banks around the world, and uh, into this space to stop this crime from occurring, because it does have social impacts around us. It does undermine the country's framework from a security perspective, from a, a social good perspective. So that is, in a nutshell, you know, what the importance is and where this comes from uh, you know uh, with fintrack how the reporting structure works is we have an obligation to report where something with where reasonable grounds to suspect has been met so it's not a legal threshold but there's certain caveats that have to be met that re result in the reporting of a transaction to FinTrack. So we, we find something unusual, like I said before, with the different trafficking types for indicator indicators for trafficking. We would then put that in a report and send it to FinTrack. Now, FinTrack has that information, and there's only two ways they can disseminate that information to law enforcement. The first one is proactively, once certain thresholds are met within FinTrack that I'm not really privy to what exactly those are, but they review them and they look to see if they meet their criteria to proactively disclose to a law enforcement agency. And the second one would be law enforcement approaching them and request requesting information from them that could be a suspicious transaction report. So it's, it's kind of like a library of a repository that disseminates proactively and reactively. So Money service businesses, casinos, real estate agencies, banks all have this obligation to report. That is not does not necessarily mean the person is doing something definitively bad. It doesn't mean your account will be shut down. We just have an obligation to report suspicious activity to FinTrack. In the United States, that organization is known as FinCEN. In Australia, OzTrack, these are all abbreviations that usually result in some form of transaction reporting and analysis center. Uh, and then you add the country codes at the top, so or at the beginning of the acronym. So you mentioned earlier that you know no arrests are made from specifically just the sp suspicious reporting as it relates to the internal operations on the banking side of things. But are you aware of any outcomes that have happened as it relates to that reporting being shared with authorities and perhaps even a trafficking ring that's been taken down as a result? Well, I would say that the, you know, the government of Canada takes privacy extremely seriously, as do the respective financial institutions that have reporting obligations, especially the large ones in the country. So because of that, there are certain confines or, or restrictions that are in place in terms of who gets what information. So it is a one-way street. When we report, that information is between the bank and FinTrack. FinTrack then gets it, and then it's between FinTrack and law enforcement. They do not come back to the banks and say, you did a great job, or this is what happened in full transparency. That is something, it is like a one-way street. Now, some would like to have that back, so it would help us get maybe more refined in our work, but there's reasons why they don't come back as well, too. So that is the one way kind of street that is built in this country and in many other countries that, that, that follow a similar approach. Uh, but you can see the role that FinTrack plays through what I would public public participation. So what I discussed previously was public private, where banks are coming together and private private as well. But banks are coming together, different industry is coming together and FinTrack is there as well. Their presence is at the table as well. Uh, they're just not leading it. They're observing and they're providing feedback from their intelligence arm. Uh, but FinTrack also engages in private public public part uh, par um, partnerships. And those public public partnerships could be with the Canadian Revenue Agency, CRA, 
our federal police, the RCMP, other municipal police forces, provincial police forces, securities regulators, and you'll see from time to time the RCMP uh, or other agencies will release a publication that will say, we took down a major fentanyl trafficking ring, or we took down a major human trafficking ring, and in there, they'll list the agencies, the government agencies that have participated in the takedown, and FinTrack is acknowledged every year many times. So that would infer that STRs are playing a role in these takedowns. So we don't know exactly which ones, but we do know FinTrack's being acknowledged, and FinTrack, you know, that could be a result of STRs. So that's how you can get a little bit of a window inside their world and what happens after the fact. That's so incredible and a really neat way just to think about how there's really a need for collaboration as it relates to combating trafficking and the unique role that the financial industry can play in working with government agencies and police forces and NGOs in order to make an impact to end this crime. It's really, really awesome work. Earlier, you mentioned something called following the money. And I'm aware there's a report called the following the money report. Can you shed light on what is that report all about and what are some of the key findings from it? I, I think one of the things they showed us when we uh, were like new recruits into the AML world of things uh, is a, like a montage. You could probably find this online. I, I think the montage may be titled Following the Money. Uh, it's, ma- it's been made infamous by so many movies, you know, Breaking Bad lately um, as a more recent example or uh, the Ozarks, uh, I think on Netflix, which I haven't seen. Uh, but a lot, I find a lot more shows are starting to talk about following the money. So I'm partial to one report called Following the Money that is specifically on trafficking across three different forms of trafficking, labor trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation, and organ trafficking. And that report was published by the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, fascinating group set up uh, post-World War II to ensure the stability between East and West, uh, Western Europe. Uh, so a lot of things have changed geographically, but the group still exists, and the group now goes beyond just ensuring stability from, from, from essentially a, a war from occurring into uh, much more nuanced things to help the countries that are participating in that group. Canada and the United States are participants in that group, even though not situated in Europe, they're very much part of that. And their headquarters is in Vienna. So they publish a number of reports that relate to tr- uh, sexual exploitation, drug abuse, uh, you know, uh, how a country's financial intelligence unit operates, like FinTrack, they'll, they'll provide comments on that as well and some recommendations. So similar to like a UN group, uh, and, they, and this report following the money, I contributed a great deal in, in that publication. It was published in late 2019, and that highlights essentially uh, all of the major publications uh, that have published indicators for trafficking across the participating states. It it references all of them, uh, all the relevant ones or the bigger ones, and it compiles and it, it, it synthesizes all of the indicators published. So think about it taking, I think we reviewed in the end, a over 50 documents of the 50, 25 approximately made it into that report. And of the 25, we identified 600 plus unique indicators that are available in that report to look at the differences between countries, the similarities between countries, where an improvement can be made and what can be done in terms of operationalizing them within a financial institution. So it's, it's a really great one-of-a-kind document right now that I hope other follows, others follow in that kind of compendium um, research report as opposed to these standalone reports that have come out before it. So much amazing work has been done in really a short period of time to provide the, this resource um, for different agencies and groups who are interested in combating trafficking through the financial sector and trainings that have been developed. And so I'm wondering if someone's tuning in and they work in the financial sector and they're thinking, hey, how can I get involved? How can I help be a part of this good fight? What would you say to those folks? Well, I would say if you're in the financial service industry uh, and you are within financial crime risk mitigation, ACAMS is a great organization. They offer certifications across a couple different fields. One of them is is uh, knowledge and trafficking and combating trafficking with financial through a financial lens. That is a great organization to meet. There's a Toronto chapter, Vancouver. There's, there's a number of chapters within Canada and worldwide. 
about 100,000 members. I would say if you don't go for the certification, think about joining the Toronto chapter so you can meet up at these events, both virtual and in person when they kick off again, uh, hopefully in the near future. So that's a great group to participate, network, and share ideas with. Uh, within your own organization, I would look at to see if you've had any involvement in public private partnerships like Project Protect, uh, if or if you had something similar. Uh, I, that's one of the things I recommend to a lot of people that ask how to get engaged. I say start at home and then work outwards because if you're if you're aligned and knowledgeable in terms of where where you stand as an institution before going outwards, uh, that is helpful as well. And then there's some great NGOs, but you, you want to be mindful about outreach because usually banks or institutions have a formal outreach chain. But I will say, let's just say you are the person in the outreach chain or outside of that altogether and just want to gain some knowledge. There's some really great knowledge holders in this country, uh, whether it's, you know, Deborah's Gate in, uh, uh, under the Salvation Army with Larissa Maxwell. Uh, you have the Center, for, uh, Canadian Center for Combating Human Trafficking that has launched their hotline. You know, I would say recently, but time is passing. I think it's established now that maybe recent is not a good term for them, uh, but they are definitely quite knowledgeable in terms of who is on their board and overseeing their, their group. Uh, and then there's Covenant House and a whole bunch of others. So those NGOs are, are engaged with, as are you, yourself, Michaela, you know a lot yourself, and we've asked you questions about sensitivity uh, before. So uh, it is cross-industry participation that we advocate for. And sometimes, you know, a simple LinkedIn request or email introducing yourself goes a long way as well, too. So it's really up to yourself in terms of how you're going to approach it. Uh, but just be respectful with outreach. And also, if you work for a company, uh, be mindful about uh, how you reach out and make sure that there's the proper approval there as well, too. Well, Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today so much important information and work that's being done. So thanks to you and your team for the essential work that you're doing to help combat the trafficking in persons. It's been just really great to have the opportunity to speak with you today. If you are listening to the show today and you're in a situation of trafficking and you're in immediate danger, please call 911 if it's safe to do so. For information and support as it relates to human trafficking in Canada, please call our Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline, which, which is available 24-7 at 1-833-900-1010. Again, that's 1-833-900-1010. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Freedom Fighters Code Gray, and we hope to catch you next time.